there are really two types of bugs that you can deal with in Windows PowerShell. The first are syntax errors. Generally speaking, that's just a typo. You know, instead of get WMI object, you typed get WIM object, right? And that's something PowerShell wouldn't understand. These usually result in a really clear error message that not only tells you there's a problem, it tells you exactly where it is and what the problem was. So these syntax errors are usually pretty easy to fix. The other type are a little tougher. These are logic errors. And with a logic error, your script runs fine, just doesn't usually do what you want it to do. Typically, and here's a big secret trick that nobody knows, the reason for logic errors is usually because either a variable or an object property contains a value other than the one you were thinking of. And that made something go different. For example, you might have an object property. Uh, let's say it's a service object and it has a status property. And you were checking to see if the status property contained started or not. When in fact, the real value in there is not started, it's running. See, it means the same thing, but it's not the exact thing you were expecting. So your script isn't going to behave exactly the way you want it to. That's the tough part about these logic errors. So the purpose of debugging is really to combat these logic errors. It's to find out where your script's actual behavior differs from your expected behavior. So whatever you expected your script to do versus whatever it's really doing. So what you're going to try and do is find out what's really inside of those variables and object properties. And in order to do this, you're going to need to predict what the script would do if it were working and then run it and see what it actually does. And you're also going to have to predict what variables and what object properties would contain. And then as the script is running, see if that's what they really contain. The trick is to just not make any assumptions when you start debugging. Don't assume that a value is where you think it is or that a variable contains what you think it does. Always write down what your expectation was. And then as part of the debugging process, validate that expectation. The minute you find a difference between reality and your expectation, you probably just found your bug. This is a buggy script that we're going to use as an example. Its purpose is to take two components of a path and create a single file path. It's supposed to add or remove backslashes as necessary so that there's only one backslash between each portion of the file path. I would expect this output to be C colon backslash program files backslash Microsoft. But when I run the script, I see that the output is different. So we'll be working on debugging this script using some of the techniques I want to show you. The first technique for finding out what's inside of an object property or a variable is the write debug commandlet. This writes objects, string, numbers, whatever you need, to a special debug pipeline. Now that debug pipeline automatically forwards those objects to out host, but instead of displaying them in the console's default color, it displays them in yellow. And there's a special built-in variable called debug preference. And that allows you to shut off this debug pipeline so that you can suppress the debug output. Now, why would you go through all this trouble? Well, here's why. The debug output, because it's yellow, stands out from your script's regular output, so you can tell the difference between them. If you're working in an integrated development environment like Primal Script, the debug output actually goes to a completely separate tab in the environment so that your script's regular output and the debug output are separated so they don't get intermingled and confusing. And by being able to use debug preference to shut off the debug pipeline, you can turn off your debug output when you're done debugging your script. That way you can leave all these write debug calls inside your script for however long you need to, forever, but you can shut them off by using debug preference. Let's take a look. I've added trace code to this script, and I've ensured that the debug pipeline is turned on by setting debug preference to continue. You'll notice several write debug calls in the script, which are intended to help me see what's going on inside my script. My general rule is that anytime I change a variable, I output that variable to write debug. So I'll run this now. Notice in Primal Script that the debug output appears in its own pane, which is convenient since it helps keep the debug output separate from the script's intended output. Right away I can see a problem. Part 2 of my file path seems to have turned into part 1. Since that's not what I expected, I need to look at the preceding code and see what went wrong. 
The problem is here, where I set part 2 equal to part 1. By changing that, I'll be fixing my script. And by having that debug information in front of me, I was able to quickly focus on the problem area of the script, provided I had a good and reasonable expectation of what should have happened. Here's my tip. Add write debug to your script as you are writing your script. Here's what I like to do. Every time I change the contents of a variable, and every time I change the contents of an object property, and every time I make a decision or a loop, like an if-then construct, which is making a decision, or a, a do construct, which is making a loop, anytime I do any of those things in my script, I just go right ahead and add a write debug line. This adds debugging capability to my script right from the very beginning. So I'll always output whatever the new value of a variable or object property is. In the case of a decision, I'll have a little write debug that says which way the decision went. In the case of a loop, I'll have a little write debug that says entering loop. I'll have another one at the end that says exiting loop. And I'll have another one right in the middle that says I'm looping for the fifth time and the sixth time so that I can really keep track of what's going on inside my script. Now there's another whole way to do debugging in Windows PowerShell that doesn't require the use of write debug, and it's called Windows PowerShell's Interactive Debugger. It's actually a primitive interactive command line step debugger. It lets you step through your code one line at a time. That's why it's called a step debugger. And allows you to suspend or pause your script at any time so you can see what's going on inside the script. Here's how to turn it on. Set PS debug dash step. And you're going to want to know how to turn it off because once you turn it on, it can be a little annoying. So to turn it off, it's set PS debug dash off. Let's see how it works. We're going to run the same script again, this time without the debug output to see how to use the interactive debugger. I've turned the debugger on and now I'm running the script. I'll be prompted for each line of script and I'll just say yes until I see a variable being changed. Ah, we're inside the function. So let's suspend the script by pressing S. We're now inside the script, and it's suspended. My function's input arguments were part 1 and part 2. So I'm going to display the contents of those variables right now. OK, those look correct. Let's exit suspend mode and let the script resume. After I've changed a couple more variables, I'm going to suspend again, and I'm going to examine those variables and I see the problem. Only two lines of code have executed since my last check, so I know it must be one of those two lines which caused the problem. The interactive debugger is a great way to watch your script execute, compare what you see to your expectations, and to examine what's inside those variables to see if it's what you expect. When something isn't what you expected it to be, you've probably found your problem. Never spot a bug just staring at your script and think you can fix it. Syntax bugs, sure, you can just find a typo and, and change it right away, no problem. But not those logic errors. See, what's going to happen half the time? You're not actually going to fix the problem. You're just going to make it worse. And you're going to think, well, I don't have to go through the whole debugging process. I can just make a quick change here and it'll fix it. And You're actually adding time to the process. If you think you found a bug, Prove it first by using the techniques I've shown you and some of the ones we're going to be looking at. And fix one thing at a time. Just one. If that doesn't fix the problem, put it back. That way you're not walking down this continually branching, ever more complicated path of madness. And always, test your WMI and ADSI queries outside the context of a script. Use something like the WBEM test tool or use PowerShell itself just to test the WMI query. Make sure you're getting back the results you expect. See, that's always the thing with debugging. Always try and test things individually to make sure you're getting back what you expect. Because bugs only happen when something different happens. Something that you didn't expect. I'll show you. Okay, let's just run a fairly simple WMI query for Win32 ping status. I'm going to set a computer name execute the WMI query, and display the resulting object's status property. Huh, didn't work. Okay, well, I'm probably just not understanding how this WMI class works, so it's time to get out of script 
and read the documentation. I've just gone to the WMI documentation for the Win32 ping status class, which I found by just typing the class name into my favorite search engine. Right away, I see my problem. This class doesn't have a name property. It has an address property. All right, my goof. So let's go back into the script, change the name to address, and try again. Huh, still no good. All right, this time let's copy the WMI query to the clipboard and run WBEM test. I'll connect to the root simv2 namespace, which is the default namespace used by PowerShell. I'll click Query and paste my query in. Now, this tool doesn't do variables like dollar sign computer, so I need to put a static value in there, like localhost, the value my script was using, so that I'm doing the same thing that my script was doing. This time the query executes and I can browse the results. Ah, problem number two is that the status property is called status code. All right, back to my script, where I'll change status to status code and run the script one last time. And this time it works. By getting out of script, I was able to spot the problems fairly quickly. Of course, the best idea is to not have bugs at all. Then you don't have to debug anything. One way to do that is to use a script editor to write your scripts. Features like color coding, code hinting, live syntax checking, and so forth can all help prevent basic syntax errors. Built-in help also makes it more convenient to look up the correct syntax when you need to. Of course, you do have to remember to use these features for them to be helpful. And aside from syntax errors, you can prevent many logic errors by simply being sure to assign a value to any variable before using it in the current scope. And since debugging is all but inevitable in a more complex script, save time and make debugging easier by adding trace code using write debug right from the outset. Pause this video and use your lab guide to complete the tasks in the lab. When you're finished, resume playing the video and I'll walk you through a sample solution. Let's review what was wrong with the script for this lab. To begin with, variable names don't get a dollar sign when they're used with the variable commandlets. So you needed to remove the dollar sign characters from the variable names there. Next, there was a typo in the function's argument, so you needed to correct that. Next, the correct property for the Win32 ping status class is address, not name. Next, there was a logic error. Status code is zero when a successful ping has been made, but PowerShell sees zero as a Boolean false. So you actually have to compare the status code to zero rather than treating it as a Boolean value. In the getOSInfo function, you have to remember that WMI always returns a collection of objects. So you usually need to enumerate through that collection, even if it contains only one item. Some operating systems will let you get away with it, so you may not have run into the error on your system. Finally, the last problem was at the bottom. You don't use a comma between parameters of a function in PowerShell. You use spaces. You won't get an error if you use commas, but PowerShell will treat the entire comma-separated list as a single array argument rather than as individual arguments, and that will give you unexpected and undesired results.